Welcome to the Literacy and Numeracy Secretariat's June webcast entitled Coaching for Student Success in Mathematics. What does it mean to coach for student success? How do high yield strategies contribute to student success in mathematics? Let's explore several key conditions that classroom, school, and district leaders can put into place to engage all students in learning significant mathematics. Welcome to our webcast on Coaching for Student Success in Mathematics. My name is Kathy Kubota Zarivni, and together we'll have a chance to explore and examine the ways that classrooms and schools and school boards coach for student success in mathematics. In classrooms, we'll have a chance to see the way that classroom teachers, consultants, principals co teach a lesson as a way of implementing a job embedded professional learning approach, as well as we'll have a chance to see teachers enact high yield strategies that make a difference in student learning. At the school level, we'll have a chance to see principals and teachers organize and implement job embedded professional learning approaches such as co-teaching and teacher inquiry and study. And of course, within school boards and across school boards, we'll see the ways that they plan and organize and implement professional learning across different regions um, within Ontario. Now let's begin our journey together. One of the realities of today's classrooms is that teachers need to develop a deep knowledge of mathematics pedagogy in order to understand and develop a repertoire of ways to work effectively with a range of students. Teachers are being asked to teach in ways that they themselves may not have experienced or seen in classroom situations. Another reality in today's classrooms is that teachers may experience difficulty allocating sufficient time for students to develop concepts of mathematics if they themselves do not appreciate the primacy of conceptual understanding. The publication of the expert panel reports for numeracy in K-6 classrooms made clear the call for a different form of instruction that directly focuses responsibility on students' achievement of expectations. The focus on student success means teachers' work centers on improving the learning of all students in their classrooms. The District School Board of Niagara, like many boards across the province of Ontario, have benefited over the last few years of a lot of wonderful materials put out by the Ministry that have allowed teachers access to research in mathematics. We've also been afforded the opportunity to give many of our teachers in-service opportunities around this research. Our math team at DSBN decided that although the in-services were wonderful and we're getting some common dialogue in staff rooms around mathematical instruction, we also knew that there was a gap between what teachers knew from the in-services and what they wanted to engage their students in and what was actually happening in a classroom. That gap between research-based pedagogy and actual classroom instruction is a fairly broad gap in some areas. Our concern was how do we bridge that gap? How do we get classroom instruction to match what the research is saying in our in-services? So it's really about focusing on what's actually happening in the classrooms. How do you move this forward? And how do we have teachers actually implement what we're talking about in those reports and in those uh, documents? In Ontario, most implementations of coaching for student success in mathematics have used a combination of co-teaching and teacher inquiry and study for their job embedded approaches. Through collaborative engagement on the part of coaches and facilitators, along with the guidance of consultants, principals, and superintendents, a form of teacher inquiry or study prevails. Through a combination of release time for classroom teachers to work and study collaboratively curriculum and pedagogy together, and release time to co-teach with partners, the district school boards have found the job embedded learning model to be most effective. Teachers set their own inquiry goals and study professional resources, curriculum, text programs, and ministry guides to learn about effective instructional practices directly related to their own classroom work. They then implement change in their own classrooms and work collaboratively to analyze and improve it. Regardless of the type of coaching, the title or job description, school-based coaches have at least two things in common. First, their mission is to assist teachers in learning and applying the new knowledge and skills necessary to improve the academic performance of all students. Second, instructional coaches spend a significant portion of their working day in direct contact with teachers in their schools and classrooms. The work is complex, requiring the people in it to be part teacher, part leader, part change agent, and part facilitator. Teacher inquiry is a job embedded professional learning framework. 
It includes three parts. The first part is the pre-discussion and planning. During that time, the teachers who are co-teaching the lesson identify the learning goal of the lesson, identify the teaching strategies of the lesson, and also set observation criteria when they're in the classroom. The second part of the teacher inquiry framework includes in-class observation of student learning and co-teaching. During this time, the teachers together observe and analyze student learning through their work samples and their oral descriptions and think about how their teaching strategies will impact student learning and possibly make changes to their decisions about the lesson. The third part is the post-discussion and next steps. After the in-class observation has taken place and the teachers have implemented the strategies they thought were best for student learning, then the teachers together think about the impact of the lesson on the students as well as reflect on what are possible next steps for the lesson tomorrow. So we're here today to work on some ideas about what the lesson will be about, to think about what students might do in relation to the lesson problem, and then discuss whether or not the strategies that the teachers have planned will be useful in the classroom. The goal of the lesson is to have the students be able to divide a set of cookies so I'm hoping that they will be able to take that and to identify a fractional piece. According to the grade three expectations, uh, the students need to use concrete materials to be able to represent and name fractional pieces. I like Mary Jo's idea that she shared with me that uh, she would like to read to the kids first and uh, introduce the concept of fair sharing by uh, reading a short story picture book to them and then asking them in small steps to model what's happening in the book and working our way up to a, a, a more substantial problem, one not from the book but is led into by reading the book where the students will uh, have to maybe put the thinking caps on a little bit and uh, the, the sharing that we ask them to do will be a little bit more challenging. So we'll have to think together in pairs and, and uh, use some manipulative, some concrete um, fractions or things that can represent fractions to, uh, to figure out the problem. Can we use this book to activate some of their prior knowledge and, and ha have that lead into a, a question? I'm hoping that the novel or that the picture book will activate some prior knowledge and by actually acting out the story on the whiteboard as we read through the story I'm hoping that that will give them you know be able to open up their schema and they'll be able to solve the problem which is a little more difficult. It's not basic um, 12 cookies and six children. It's how could five children share 12 cookies? What do you think it is that the kids will be, will be showing? They'll need to model their thinking. And through the, through the, the book po portion of the, the read aloud and the students modeling their thinking as they go through the read aloud, that should give them the foundation to model their thinking when they when they do the problem solving. I'm hoping they'll be able to represent a fraction um, using drawings and using uh, manipulatives or using actual circles. Okay, so we want to so watch for that. We want to watch because I think that's going to show the readiness for the actual problem that the storybook will actually evoke from them. Will it be uh, simple groupings for them? No. Yes. It will be, okay. The numbers in the in the story are actual simple like 12 um, cookies, two children, 12 cookies, three children, 12 cookies, four children, and even numbers that they will be able to split equally and evenly. Okay. To try to move them from part of a set, and then we will actually be making them do part of a whole because it won't work out perfectly. So hopefully that's a transition they're ready for. Okay. There's also going to be a, a component of having to have equivalency there as well, right? Because students will have to have the same size of portion if they're going to be d dividing up these, uh, I think you said cookies, right? Yes. In your lesson coming up. So we, the cookies are going to divide that up. We're going to need that to be equal to some degree, the kind of sharing aspect, right? Right. And I think that we've kind of thought that through with the use of manipulatives that we have. We have actual circles that they will be able to use, and we have fraction mats that they can look at and actual fraction circles if they want to. So really it's fractions as a region. Mm -hmm. The kids will see that mm -hmm. each part will be congruent. Mm -hmm. Same size, same shape. Unlike fractions of a set, you can have a big cookie mm -hmm. and a small cookie 
and that could make one whole, but they're different sizes, but we're not going there. We no. want equal size or fair sharing. Correct. Okay, so tell us about the lesson problem. Well, the lesson problem came out of the literature, um, the children sharing these cookies. So we decided the lesson problem should be um, how could five, five children share 12 cookies fairly? And then asking them to represent their, um, their ideas um, using diagrams or concrete materials. And I believe that's it. That's the, that's the problem. And solving it in a different way if, if they have time permits? Yes. So let's put our heads together. What are the different ways? What are we going to anticipate to see as we're observing kids and they're learning and they're doing? What do you want us to listen for? Because our job is to give you feedback about what we hear kids doing and saying. What's your plan for that? My plan for this consolidation is after the band show and talking about students um, thinking uh, to provide them with another problem to work on independently. Again, the sharing perhaps not of cookies, but of something else, another something, and see if they can take what they've learned and expanded their thinking into their independent work. Okay. Also in terms of Bancho, are you going to try a Bancho today with them? Yes, yeah. our intention was a Bancho. And do you have a Bancho plan in mind of what you might see as categories? Well, we came up with um, ideas as to what solutions we thought the students might come up with, and the plan is to put um, their thinking on the board from left to right and to maybe have the children, you know, to group like solutions together and then come up with labels that go underneath their solutions to explain their thinking as it moves along the continuum. But we found it tough to plan too far ahead when it came to, we just didn't know exactly what, we thought we knew what we might see, we didn't know what concepts they would be and if we had to break the concepts into four or five different Division. So that's when we do need the, the help of the group when it's beneficial to have a large co-teaching project like today, or at the very least if it was only the two of us. That's what we need to be able to get the feedback from your partner um, as quickly as possible so that you can start to sort. How is the band show going to look? What's going where? Where to start? I think we're looking for clarity of um, the way they solve the problem as well. How clear is it? And their progression as and it moves. Precision and the use of mathematical symbols and terms and diagrams, labeled, things like that. Yeah. Yes. Well, you think about when we did the problem and how we showed our band show. We also had difficulty with actually looking at the categories. But at the same point, we looked at hold apart mm -hmm. as an idea, the idea if we couldn't divide it, and using more clear and precise language. So I guess, you know, based on our experience when we did the problem, it just makes sense that you would use that as criteria. But we'll see. What do you want us to to listen for because our job is to give you feedback about what we hear kids doing and saying. So give us two things that you want us to pay attention to in terms of what they'll be doing mathematically. Do you see that with t sufficient time and support are they going to get to fifths? Okay. Are they going to get there? And so, if it, I'm sorry. So we're looking it, for halves, fifths, that kind of language? Yep, yep. Halves, fifths, thirds, quarters. Are they using that? Are they working their way towards fifths? Do they actually understand that there can be a whole number and a fraction as okay, well that they're the looking case. for? Okay. Anything else we should be listening for? To see how their mathematical understanding of fractions is developing during the lesson? Even parts and holes. And, yeah, and pieces yeah. and um, decomposing them, mm -hmm. composing them. Mm -hmm. We want to see that. And sharing fairly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what we're looking for. So when we go in to see your work, um, we'll be in the outskirts. Um, listen to kids. <laughs> we won't be interacting because that's not our job. That's your job. But we will be there as extra eyes and ears, provide you with feedback and to help you to make decisions about your lesson, how it's going to play out. How will you consolidate their solutions? What's your plan for that? My plan for this consolidation is after the band show and talking about students um, thinking uh, to provide them with another problem. Okay. okay, so we'll go in your classroom and we'll, we'll see what happens. Great. So Nick, time in your life or at home or at school that you've had to share with someone. Can you do that for me? So turn and talk with your partner about sharing. Well, today we're going to read a story called The Doorbell Ring Rang by Pat Hutchins, 
And it's a story about sharing. But it's a story about children sharing cookies. So not sharing rooms or not sharing um, toys, but instead sharing cookies. Okay? And while we, are, while we are reading this story, we're actually going to act the story out, which is one of our problem-solving strategies. We're going to act the story out on the whiteboard. I have some people, because there's people in the story, and I have some cookies for the story. I've made some cookies for tea, said Ma. Good, said Victoria and Sam. We're starving. Share them between yourselves, said Ma. I've made plenty. Have you ever had to share cookies before? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that's good to share. That's six each, said Sam and Victoria. They look as good as Grandma's, said Victoria. They smell as good as Grandma's, said Sam. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. So grade threes, how many students, or how many children are there in our story so far? Amanda? Two. There are two children. Amanda and Jacob, would you please go up to the front board and, and you're going to be our, our actors. We're going to model this together. So the two will be up to the front board. So we have two children. Can you model two children for me? Mr. Gracie will can set, you can put them right on right the whiteboard. Board. Great. Now the children in the story said um, that's six each. So how many cookies do we have all together? Kathleen. There's twelve because six plus six is twelve. Great. So what Amanda and Jacob are going to do is they're going to put six cookies around each person to show that they are going to get six cookies each. And Jacob, how did you know you put six and Amanda put six as well? How did you know it was six? Um, because um, 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 six times two is twelve. Yeah, and there's twelve cookies, so it had to be six times two is twelve. Okay. Does everyone get the same amount of cookies? Yes. yes, they do. Well, let's continue. It was Tom and Hannah from next door. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. Now Tom and Hannah have arrived. So now how many people are there? Bradley? There's four people. If there are four people now, how many cookies is each person going to get? Caroline? Three. Three. Hands up or a thumbs up if you and your partner came up with three cookies each. Why don't you take the cookies on the board and share them fairly? And Amanda, how did you know to put three cookies for each person? Because I know that three times two equals six and half of six is three. Half of six is three, and wh so why, why did you need to know that half of six was three? So, because there was another person coming, so I had to split them in half. You had to split the six cookies in half. Great. Okay, we're going to continue with our story and see if we're right. That's three each, so we were right, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma, said Tom, and they look as good, said Hannah. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. What do you predict is going to happen? Um, there's going to be two more people. Well, let's find out. It's Peter and his little brother. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. I think now we should watch Amanda and Jacob. We've got two more people coming in. Can you put two more people on the board, please? And can the two of you... Share those cookies fairly? Go ahead. Amanda, can you tell me what you did to share those cookies fairly? I took one from each um, person and gave it to the one person so they have two each. So that they have two each. Jacob, what did you do? Um, since I know they had three and these people had none, um, so um, he had to give one cookie to him, and so did this person over here to give one cookie to him. So it would all be even. So it would all be even. That's great. 
That's two each, said Victoria and Sam. They look as good as your grandma, said Peter, and smell as good. Nobody makes cookies like grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. You think more people are going to come in? Yeah. I think so. It was Joy and Simon with their four cousins. So how many more people have come in? Avely? Um, six. So the six people are going to come in. Come in, said Ma. You can share the cookies. Okay, and now we've seen that six more people are going to come in. So let's see if you can share those cookies fairly so everybody gets some. And Amanda, what are you doing? I'm taking one cookie away from the three people and giving them to the other people because they have none and they have two. Okay. Good thinking. That's one each, said Sam and Victoria. They smell as good as your grandma's, said Joy. And they look as good, said Simon. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. What do you think might happen if more people come in? They would all have to split them in half so that everybody got them. They may have to split them in half. They may have to split the cookies. Why are they going to have to split the cookies, Bradley? Because everybody has one cookie now. And if you take one whole cookie away from one person, then they'll have zero, and, every, and other people will have one. So if it, you split it in half by everybody, then they'll all have the same amount. Well, let's try it, see what we come up with. No one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang and rang. Oh dear, said Ma, as the children stared at the cookies on their plates. Perhaps you better eat them before we open the door. <laughs> we'll wait, said Sam. It was Grandma with an enormous tray of cookies. How nice to have so many friends to share them with, said Grandma. It's a good thing. I made a lot. So are they going to have to share, break up their cookies and share them? No. Not this time. And no one makes cookies like Grandma, said Ma, as the doorbell rang. So now, our problem is, how can, could five children share 12 cookies fairly? So you need to think about how five children are going to share 12 cookies. And if you notice, in purple, it says, solve the problem using diagrams, and or concrete materials and show your solution on chart paper. We, Mr. Gracie and I have everything you need to solve this problem on the side table. So we have to split it into four. How about we try and split it into four? Like four? So then... So let's try it just that, in terms again. From here. So why don't I make a nice, why don't we make a nice pile on here? Then you yeah, it looks like what they've done is they've, they've, they've got all the people drawn out, yeah, and they're trying to separate the pieces yeah. for the extra two, yeah. and, and they're trying to distribute them on the page. And when I, when I look over at what she's got there, she's got a, uh, a circle divided into five pieces, and, and so I they too were not just thinking about a half a cookie, but it was less than a half. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were really getting the idea that it was one fifth of the cookie. I agree with that. So, have you noticed anything? I noticed that there was a group of kids who were still stuck with more children were going to come. And if they were saving those extra two cookies because they divided and had ten of them used, but then they were holding on to those other two cookies for kids who came, or someone who came in through the door. Um, and I noticed that they're dividing in half. They want to divide all of their cookies in half. So yes. 24 halves, and they're trying to make that fit for this time. That's right. It's back to that even number that they can try to do instead of just taking, you know, it's the one half, the whole cookie. That's how they want to see how they can't seem to go beyond that point. Right. Okay, so now we have to kind of sort the student solutions to see um, how to set up the band show. Can you tell me what you noticed um, 
my students doing or what their thinking was. Then we tried fives, but it didn't work. Um, we gave five cookies to each person, but it didn't work. So we tried to split two cookies in fifths and left the rest whole. So I split two cookies into fifths and left the rest whole. And can you explain why did you do that? Why fifths? Um, we tried halves, but it didn't work. And then we tried fourths, so it didn't work. So we thought fifths might work. So you tried, thought fifths might work. Good. I'm going to move this solution over to one. Um, maybe all the way over to here. And we'll talk about why it belongs there a little later. OK. Um, Avely. You've got a nice picture here, and it said that what we did was we gave everyone one cookie until we ran out of cookies, and we had to give some people halves, but we had the same amount, but one person had one left, so we couldn't be holes. Can you explain your thinking? We did that because we, tr we tried this, the, it whole, but when we tried it whole, it didn't fit enough enough people because one person had because one person only had two holes and the rest had another half with it. So then we so then we tried all halves and it still didn't work. So we thought that it so um we so it couldn't be and so you can't split five with it with five people. You can't split twelve cookies with five people. You can't split 12 cookies yeah, with five you need, cookies. Yeah, you need three more. You need three more cookies in order to do it. Yeah, or a half. These are halves, right? So one half here, one half here, one half. Am I correct? Yeah. OK. But you say that they can't split yeah. 12 cookies into five people. OK, I'm actually going to move Avely's solution as well. Move it down. She tried halves, though. All right, our next solutions, um, Kristen and Jake said, we split two cookies into five pieces. The bag. Kristen and Jake, can you explain, or one of you, explain your thinking there? We tried to um, give everybody the same amount of cookies, but we figured out we needed three more, so we tried to split it so everybody would get five little pieces, or two extra two little pieces. So that's what we came up with. So and Jake, why did you split the cookie into five, and not into halves, or not into quarters? Why did you split it into fifths? So everybody, so everybody can have the same amount. So everyone could have the same amount. And how would everybody get the same amount if they were going to have fifths? Um, why did you choose? Mm -hmm. Kristen, do you know why you chose fifths? Everyone would get two. Everyone would get two. Um, moving on, we've got this solution here. It says each person gets two cookies and two tiny pieces. So whose solution is this? Oh, that's still your solution? Okay, Kristen, you explain your thinking there? Well, it's kind of the same one because we uh, messed up on one. So we drew another picture. So why did you say two tiny pieces? They've um, got two. Did you share these cookies first? Uh, yeah. You shared the, the whole cookies first. And then and what then was we, left over? Uh, two, and we split them into tiny pieces. And you split those two cookies into ten pieces. Yeah. Okay. Jacob and Amanda, you've got, you actually took your cookies. Can you explain what you did here? Took your cookies? We cut out uh, the two cookies and glued them on to the sheet of paper. And we decided to cut them into fists because there was five people and it would be easier if you cut them into fists. So each fifth was for one person. So I could write one cookie two cookies, and then one-fifth yeah. of a cookie, and one-fifth of a cookie? Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. And then what, what about your explanation up here? We were, we drew all the cookies and then put check marks 
check marks on them and put them underneath the people. And we, we ended up with two cookies left, and we used our fraction mat to see which one would work. How did you decide which one to use? We thought that this would work best because there was five of them. Because there were five people. Yeah. So our last solution is this one. Justin and Marley said each kid gets two and two-fifths. Justin, do you want to explain how you came up with two and two fists? We looked on the fra fraction mat and saw that um, um, we had the cookie, that um, pay, 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 the pay, pay paper model, and um, the fraction mat showed like pra practically the exact same. So we just um, took the the cookie and did the exact same thing that they did on the paper, and we saw that if we give if there's two cookies left over, then we can give one fifth out of that one cookie to each person, and then what one fifth out of that uh, out of the other cookie to each person. And so, then what else did you notice? Then, if you gave one fifth out of one cookie and one fifth out of another cookie, they they would all get two two fifths. I'll get two fifths. So now what we're going to do is we're going to label our thinking under our solutions. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about our solutions and we're going to label our thinking underneath. So these two people or these two groups decided that you can't share, fair share, whole cookies. Okay? These two groups decided that, you know what, we can't cut the pieces. Their solution shows that you can't cut the cookie up to share fairly those extra cookies. So they said we needed to stop. Ryan and Riley, where do you think that your solution would fit now? I think it should go over with Abley's and theirs because full cookies don't they can't make full shares or... So you're saying that you think now that when you did this, you were thinking along the same lines as Avery and yeah. Austin, that you couldn't share fair share whole cookies. Yeah. Riley, would you agree? I agree with Riley and Ryan that I think that we can move their solution up into can't fair share whole cookies. So this next set of solutions, we decided that you could share whole cookies. And split others into five pieces each. And I think that that shown in here, we split two cookies into five pieces. And again, this group here had their cookies and they split those two extra ones into five pieces. What did we do here that was different than what we did here? What's different about this solution than this solution? Yes. The, uh, this group didn't do share whole cookies and split into five pieces. They just, they did one, and they did two pieces, two cookies, and then they did one fifth, but they didn't split it into five pieces. They split into all these groups. So what you're saying is they split their extra cookies, their two cookies into five pieces, but these people split it into um, it's split into two whole pieces and then and then one fifth. Right. They they use something. These this group used something that this one said into five pieces. This group used something that was a little different. They used the actual cookies. 
cookie, the fake cookies. They did. They used the actual fake cookies. Anybody see something that they did, they used? What they used, they used fractions for their circles and the, um, because on the one, it says on the little triangles, it says one-fifths, so they used fractions on theirs. They were sharing cookies. and splitting into fifths. What did they do that was a little different than any of the other two? Remember, can't fair share whole cookies, sharing whole cookies and splitting the others into five pieces. Sharing cookies and splitting it into, we're using more math language now, we're saying splitting it into fifths. What did this final group do that was a little different again? They used two wholes and two fifths. Right. So they used the whole number and the fraction together. So very good. So this group, two and two fifths. So now we've just had an experience in the classroom of co-teaching. And many of us had the opportunity to observe the students learning as the co-teachers were working through the lesson. So let's find out what we, what we learned and let's find out what we saw in terms of students learning and how it related to the instructional strategies. I didn't expect to see the some of the accuracy of some of the samples. The the group that got right down to two saying each each kid would get two and a fifth. Uh, two, or two, and two, two and two fifths. They were that accurate. Yeah, I didn't I was completely happy with the idea that they really struggled for a while and I yeah. I really wanted to jump in and to, you know, help them out but you know we decided as a threesome not mm -hmm. to intervene at the moment and then they were just on the cusp of getting you know the understanding and they got it just by standing back where I think if I hadn't been in a co-teaching situation I may have jumped in prematurely but with you know the guidance I decided okay nope we're gonna let them go that maybe that's what was most striking that they got it without our help yes which mm -hmm. is yeah a different concept that takes a little little getting used to. And what I found too was that they didn't give up and I love when I saw the cross and they said okay we're going to try again. And they were drawing it over again and trying to figure it out and then no that's not working so they would cross it out and then they would try again instead of giving up and uh, that I really and I was glad I was tempted to say maybe if we just give them the scissors or give them the you know, some glue to show that they can cut it out. But we stopped, and and uh, we even through our conversation, we realized, no, we have to give them more time. And, and while we were talking, they were figuring it out without us. And so it was, it was a good, a great experience. It was. it was very interesting to see that uh, the student, she, um, she had them divide out in twos, and then she's trying to figure out the fractional component. And she drew a circle and had it drawn up into fifths, and then chose not to use it because it wasn't in her terminology. She wanted to use halves, she wanted to mm. use thirds. And mm. I found it very interesting that she left that and went back to halves. And, and, then, and then she reasoned that this is why we needed more cookies because we couldn't divide it evenly. So I thought that was an interesting strategy that she came up with. But where I'm, what I'm encouraged is that I, I think now she's someone that's on the cusp of getting that. And so you did get some students that got fifths and she's right there on the doorstep, and we've got some uh, something there we can activate, I think. You facilitated her thinking, so what you could see is that progression of thinking going there. So as you uh, folks really let them struggle with the problem, you kind of facilitated their learning. 
because I saw them first go to the halves, right? You know, they yes. first went and they said, okay, so I can do halves. And then they slowly kept on breaking it down to where they could actually do that kind of a, the, the problem much more efficiently. But I thought it was really interesting that the facilitation was first let them kind of struggle with it, but also then they could go to the halves and to the next ones. And your fraction mat really helped that process because they could see that kind of progression and then start to kind of link on to something that they, something that they already had known. What about the, the uh, sample of student work that, as the children described it, was much richer than what they were able to put on paper? So what they were able to put on paper was only a, a fraction of their thinking, so to speak. And when they had the opportunity to explain their thinking, and you were able to provide that uh, differentiation of instruction for them, that moved their answer farther farther down the scale. scale. And that dialogue continued throughout the whole classroom, because as one group would you know, share their answer, you'd see other partners talking about their answer in relation to that one, which was great because the dialogue was really rich. It wasn't a silent room, but there was so much learning happening at all the different groups. Something I was curious about, during the lesson, I noticed that you deliberated a few times, and I, I was just wondering what kind of changes, adjustments were you able to make during the lesson? Because it, it seemed to me that you had some good discussions happening through that lesson, and it, I think that kind of reveals some of the power of co-teaching. Well, the one significant mm -hmm. one was um, I was ready to jump in and to give them a hand. And we had decided as a team that, you know what, no, they need to struggle a little bit longer. And just as we were having that discussion, all of a sudden we could hear around us, you know, the students coming up with solutions. And I think another time um, I stopped the lesson, had them come back um, for a clarification. So we got together decided something needed to be clarified. With the uh, fraction mat. Right, with they the use of the, it, yeah. they weren't yeah. using the fraction yeah. mat, so I stopped the lesson. So we, yeah. we talked about, you know what, I think you should, mm -hmm. you know, show them the fraction mat and give them those. So we, we had those conversations and we could make on the spot decisions about the learning, which is very, very powerful. So the annotation was really good too, that you were uh, going on with the whole piece of doing the, um, uh, annotating the fifths on and talking about the fifths. Because in the lesson, I started seeing uh, students go to the, the halves with a friendly fraction, right? And they could do the thirds and the fourths, but then they said the fives, right? They didn't yes. have that language yet. But as they saw their, uh, their classmates come with that, and you didn't need to introduce it, another student had to introduce that to yes. them. And then you could see that progression, like you're talking about, from left to right. And students who had already said, well, I want to take that learning and, and apply that. So that one uh, answer, the student was already saying fifths. Like they had already made that yeah. internalization right. because they were uncomfortable, if you will, I think, with yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But they, that oral language really developed and the communication was developing through the lesson. And I was amazed that the one student at the very end said two and two-fifths, which is the mm -hmm. beginning of a mixed number, mm -hmm. which I had not anticipated at all. Mm -hmm. You know, for a grade three student, mm -hmm. that was very... I know, when you think of the goals we had in our pre-discussion, you're talking about them just separating the knowledge of, of whole and fraction piece, and yeah. basically you're able to accomplish them understanding a mixed fraction. So that was interesting to see. Mm -hmm. So as, as we think about what we saw and what we've learned, what are your next steps? What's going to happen tomorrow? I, th I think I will revisit the band show. Um, just, you know, that's something that you don't want to all of a sudden abandon. I want to go back to it and look at it again so that they can use their new thinking in their independent problems. I like the, I like the, um, the just-in-time feedback you get from your peers when you're, you're co-teaching. And for the band show, for me, for where I am, uh, I know my, the best learning I will do around the band show will come when I'm co-teaching, uh, when I get somebody else's feedback. So today, like when I have a lot of opportunity to work with a lot of different people, or even if tomorrow's lesson is just with Mary Jo or one other person, um, that's my next step, is uh, getting the instantaneous feedback as the kids are doing work yeah. right away. Not waiting until tomorrow or next week and try and guess what they were doing or thinking. Getting it back right away and, and then making your um, judgments on, on how to run or operate or display your band show. Yeah, it's pretty challenging to identify the sorting criteria mm -hmm. for a band show mm -hmm. in relation to the lesson goal, right. in relation to the range of student responses. Mm -hmm. And I agree that all our heads together help to do that. Well, I definitely think you've got some students in your class that can move beyond those friendly fractions. That there's, there's some room there now that you can maneuver through. Okay, so 
that was a great session today, our, our co-teaching day, and we'll meet next time to continue some more study and some co-teaching. So, great job. All eyes and ears are on the students. Inquiry engages teachers in working on dilemmas and difficult situations that will appear in every teacher's practice. Participants learn that solutions depend on contextual information, that there's never only one answer to any one problem. As educators, familiar with the tensions, demands, and needs that must be addressed in an hourly or even minute-to-minute -minute basis in classrooms, teachers find themselves challenging assumptions held for many years. They re-examine their strategies and are supported and stimulated to try fresh ways of dealing with dilemmas in practice. Instead of an expert telling teachers what works, and should be carried out in practice, inquiry participants are able to revisit scenarios in their own classrooms, draw on their experiences of success or failure, and share expertise from a variety of perspectives. Co-teaching is an informal professional learning arrangement in which educators with different knowledge, skills, and talents have agreed to share the responsibility for designing, implementing, monitoring and or assessing a curriculum program for a class of students on a regular basis. This could be bi-weekly, monthly or per term. Having a co-teacher in the room really um, helps me as a teacher who is kind of overseeing the entire lesson um, make sure that I get, I get a chance to highlight some of the um, important math that's going on with individual students. I think it helps too with the planning where you're going to go next with the lessons, mm -hmm. being able to see the patterns in the classroom with the children. Share with your partner some time in your life or at home or at school that you've had to share with someone. We put the bubbly video part from impossible to certain and kind of made it like a number line up to six. Um, up to six. By like we went out we to get a game. We went from impossible, unlikely, and inferiority, and another inferiority, then to likely. I'm not just in blue. They was the color. Cause the other was in blue. We said what if I am probable the PG in blue. So, see, um, um, I'm just in black, c'est presque impossible. Oh, c'est oui. bon point. Oh, um, for me, c'est just le combien de, um, le couleur que tu as choisi. Mm -hmm. Ça, c'est ce qui compte. Madison, si tu dois placer ce papier sur le Okay. So now, our problem is, how can, could five children share 12 cookies fairly? I want you to think, if we were to build these two patterns with color tiles, what they would look like. And think about the number of blocks that you would have. Would there be the same number with any of those two patterns that we have? We are going to get you to work now with these color tiles and the pattern. So we are going to use our two color, color tiles in our pattern, and I want you to work with a partner and build number of blocks equals position number times five plus three, and the other partner will build position number times six plus two, and then we will build the first four positions, zero, one, two, and three, and take a look and see how many blocks we'll have in total at each so if we have to split it into four, how about we try to split it into four, like four, three, four, and then we'll have four, five. So Max, if I asked you how many green blocks there would be in the tenth position, how could you figure that out? Um, it would count up by five every time to ten. Okay. Well, you count five to ten. Okay. Five, ten, ten, 
go on to ten. Can you do it for me? Can you can you show me what you're thinking yeah. so I can see the thinking? Here. Okay. Okay. And what do the three red ones mean? Um, times um, plus three. Plus three. So the total number of blocks would be. Excellent. Good thinking. What would you explain on the paper? That we picked blue and yellow that would be unlikely to pick a really bad. Okay. Um, a lot of students, especially at our school, a lot of times they'll not necessarily have that confidence when sharing the responses. They'll tend to talk down or be really quiet about their knowledge, but especially with the way things are working in, our, in Ontario, we really want students to communicate, and you can't have effective communication unless the students are confident. Me, bud? Your notebook, please. That's good. Let's see how to do it. Nathan, you have your new range. You're going to have a chance to look at someone else's pattern. See if you can discover which pattern goes with the rule that you made on your desk. What I'd like you to do now is stand. Push your chair. Really, really look at the patterns. What pattern rule is this from Bowen? How do you know? I have them begin on the carpet, so they'll lay them down and they'll try to put an, a strategy that they've used similar to another strategy so that we sort of have them grouped together uh, according to strategies that they've used. Uh, then they go up on the wall, and this is uh, basically where it sort of came from. This is a Japanese blackboard. So they're almost arranged like a graph. So you'll have one strategy with two or three samples in there, and then another strategy with uh, four, maybe five strategies, and so on, depending on how many strategies they have. And this is where the real learning goes on. This is where the real mathematics in my classroom happens. And now I want you to take a moment to think, pair, and share with the person sitting beside you. Think about how your patterns are the same and how they are different, and record that in your book. You may need to draw your, your partner's pattern in your book as well. And see if you can tell me and your partner how they are the same and different. So in contributing to the safety within the classroom, it's really important that the setup of the classroom reflects the type of instruction that I want to have. So within my class, I have groups of four students. And I try to keep it at a maximum of four just because from studying, I know that with cooperative learning strategies, once it gets over four students and five and six, the level of accountability within those groups diminishes. Math games are really great too because they help to develop the social skills. They have to be able to work with another person in their class, share their ideas with their peers, cooperate and play the game together. There's a lot of communication practice. They're using math language, which is really great. They're using their reasoning and math thinking, which comes into it from any types of games, even snakes and ladders. A game like that, there's a lot of communication in there. A lot of our books also support our, our science program. So that was another use. When we were teaching a science unit, we would find a, a book, in a nonfiction book, and uh, Jessica was so wonderful. For me, I know it's teaching is almost like acting. Every day you have to be passionate. So I really love mathematics. So I want my students to love it as well. So we always talk about students being engaged, but I think it's really important for the teacher to be engaged in what's going on. Because if I'm not engaged, <laughs> there's no way that my students will be. When teachers came um, to, to, to borrow books from the library, we often talk, spoke to them and to see what they were doing um, and to further help them with, with what resources that they, what, that they need and let them know what was available. So if they came, for example, saying, you know, I'm teaching a probability unit and I don't have a lot of problems for, for probability, then, you know, they would be directed to, you know, the, the, the books that would help them teach probability for that lesson for their unit. With the literature pulling it in is that when we read a story, my students are finding math problems within the story 
they'll say to me, hey, this is a math problem, and then it will turn into a math discussion. So they're thinking about math, they're using that math language when I wasn't in expecting it. I wasn't seeing that problem, and they're finding them now. By the next year, we had several other teachers interested, and we just, little by little, through PD, at staff meetings, and uh, through sharing our, our lessons and all the excitement and talk in the staff room, uh, we ended up with this year every single classroom, um, 17 classrooms, all doing teaching math through problem solving. When I first started off, I started off really easy just by reading the material. So looking at the Van Du Waal, the Marilyn Burns problems, looking at Kathy Fosnott's material, and just reading and becoming familiar with the different problems, the different strategies, and looking at how children develop their number sense. From there, I started doing one problem a week and using a simple, reliable problem, looking at Marilyn Burns, uh, which allowed me to see what things I was looking for, um, and it's a problem that's laid out for you. So this year, uh, early on, what we decided to do was try to identify some potential boards that we could work with. And what we wanted to do is choose a board that is, is close so we could have some neighboring schools. But what we also want to do is prove that it doesn't have to be your, your next door neighbor. You could build capacity with boards that, that have some distance apart from you. Because one of our goals was to use technology as best we could also to bridge that communication. And in doing that, then we can prove that across the province, uh, boards can work collaboratively on any project. So what we were able to do is bounce ideas off each other and have that critical friend who could say, uh, I'm not really sure that would be the best way or the best way to elicit higher uh, thinking uh, skills from our teachers. And what we did is we really co-taught this process together as, w as we brought teachers together between both school boards and then uh, facilitated a research group that had responsibility, responsibility to go back and co-teach in their classrooms together. So we literally facilitated a process where uh, teachers came together, they learned uh, the research on higher level thinking in math and on things like the band show and about how do we keep student thinking front and center in the math classroom. We revisit that thinking, we make sure we expand that thinking and we show mm -hmm. student progression of thought in, in a numeracy context. And by doing this together, we were able to then bring the expertise from both districts as well as the Literacy Numeracy Secretariat and bring that together to, uh, to our teachers and to our students in the classrooms. Mm -hmm. And our teachers found the literacy skills which we've been emphasizing within the literacy projects were a natural to bring into our numeracy classes. Two things come to mind. Last year, the, the, the big breakthrough for us was the use of band show. Uh, it was an aha moment for all of our teachers, and it was something that a lot of them continued to work with. And it, and it is something that we're, we're determined to continue to, to, to extend our learning and to continue to work with. So we're very excited about that accomplishment. So band show is key for us, and we plan to move forward with that. And then this year, for, for me, the, the, the key uh, discovery or the, the, the key um, breakthrough, this year our key breakthrough was the whole idea of using co-teaching as a professional development uh, strategy. And what we've seen, teachers have embraced that opportunity. Yes, there's discomfort at first, sharing. That, that, this is an uncomfortable feeling when you're not used to working with, with, with teachers. You're used to being in your classroom. But once you break down that barrier and enable teachers to work together, there's no turning back. And we know now there's no turning back. We, what we're trying to do in the future is refine what co-teaching is so we can best utilize that. And in addition to that, I know what I'd like to do is every project I take from here on out, every professional learning development that our board uh, deals with it in terms of numeracy, what I'd like to do is have co-teaching at the heart of it. And we've begun to do that this year, and I think it's going to pay some great dividends down the road, especially when we work towards implementing uh, dif differentiated instructional strategies where, where teachers really need to refine and focus their teaching. For us to be able to design professional development, to work with the teachers, work with the consultants, and actually go into the classrooms and work with the teachers as they're coaching their students, it's like multi-level coaching, and it's so exciting for us. So we're learning so much. We're getting coached by the teachers and by the consultants, and learning a lot from the kids. And we get to give back as well, in terms of supporting teachers, consultants, and student learning. Another thing uh, that we did was we included key questions in each mm -hmm. lesson. 
And those key questions have become really important for the teachers as a structure to help them in their, in their questioning with students and has led to this increased student discourse. As you listen to the teachers, principals, and superintendents speak, you will hear them refer to books they have studied, resources they have investigated, and videos they have viewed and critically discussed. Their time together is used to build common language and common images of the effective practices they want to promote in their own context. Like students, before they can communicate clearly about the new ideas, they have to practice using their words with their peers. As we uh, were into this project and began the project, uh, teachers really began to be a little bit um, uncomfortable mm -hmm. with the fact that you'd have somebody else coming in mm -hmm. and, and watching them teach. Um, opening the classroom up was certainly an area where it was a beginning point which was a little bit uncomfortable. Yes. But what started happening is by focusing on the students, it wasn't about that teacher mm -hmm. as a good teacher or a bad teacher. It was right. really about what do we see from the students and how can we move those, that student learning forward in numeracy. And for our principals that was a big risk as well because not all of our principals were comfortable in a particular grade teaching numeracy. So all the players in this project had huge professional growth. So we started really with building relationship from that first day because everyone wondered what are we actually going to be doing together? We're going to go in each other's classrooms? Now what? So we really started to build relationships between teachers. So you were more comfortable and those teachers were more comfortable going into the other person's classroom. And then as we kept on coming together, we kept on gathering together for more in-depth in -depth, uh, inquiry into mathematics and into the numeracy aspects of the research. And when we did that, then suddenly we had something to talk about. So we had built the relationships, now we were talking about a numeracy focus. And as the co-teaching happened, people were still nervous as it began, but became less nervous. And in fact, through the project now as we're nearing its finish and conclusion, what we're seeing is a lot of teachers who are saying, I'd like to co-teach mm -hmm. with someone at my school, and I'd like to invite somebody else in my classroom. And they're saying things like, it's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. You just come in and we're just going to talk about what do the students need to know and what do the students mm -hmm. need to learn. Two things come to mind. Last year, the, the, the big breakthrough for us was the use of band show. It was an aha moment for all of our teachers, and it was something that a lot of them continued to work with. And it, and it is something that we're, we're determined to continue to, to, to extend our learning and to continue to work with. So we're very excited about that accomplishment. So Bancho was key for us, and we plan to move forward with that. This year, our key breakthrough was the whole idea of using co-teaching as a professional development uh, strategy. And what we've seen, teachers have embraced that opportunity. Yes, there's discomfort at first, sharing. There's an uncomfortable feeling when you're not used to working with, with, with teachers. You're used to being in your classroom. But once you break down that barrier and enable teachers to work together, there's no turning back. And we know now there's no turning back. We, what we're trying to do in the future is refine what co-teaching is so we can best utilize that. And in addition to that, I know what I'd like to do is every project I take from here on out, every professional learning development that our board uh, deals with it in terms of numeracy, what I'd like to do is have co-teaching at the heart of it. And we've begun to do that this year, and I think it's going to pay some great dividends down the road, especially when we work towards implementing uh, dif differentiated instructional strategies where, where teachers really need to refine and focus their teaching. As an instructional leader, I'm able to empower our SUM math teacher. Um, this type of distributive leadership provides her with the opportunity to be a mentor and a coach to all the staff at our school. And one of the benefits we've found is that there's um, an enthusiasm for math that hasn't been in our building before. The teachers are very uh, open to sharing their successes and things that they've been doing in their classroom as a result of working with the instructional coach. Our some teacher is able to provide differentiation for all of the identified students in our school. Um, she's able to provide a, a variety of teaching strategies so that all students can succeed in math. And with, along with that, um, our teachers have attended uh, Math Matrix workshops in the past year. And I think working with the instructional coach has allowed them to have a greater confidence. They're willing to um, actually try some of the strategies that have been discussed at the workshop, knowing that they're working with someone else. And they've also had the opportunity to team teach. 
and uh, try out some of these strategies together and achieved uh, a lot of great degree of success. As a math facilitator, just in this last year, I, I'd have to say that I found the John Vandewal uh, student-centered learning books to be a great asset. Um, personally, I have a lot of experience in uh, primary classes, but I still feel drawn to um, getting new ideas and activities from the Vandewal books but also when I was called in to do some teaching in the junior classes where I have less experience, I would also be um, drawn toward those books. But it's the relationship piece that has been the success story for our math facilitators. They have got into those schools as teams. They entered as cluster teams. They listened to those administrators. They provided suggestions. They did some problem solving. They analyzed the data and they were not afraid to get into the classrooms. That's where they wanted to be. Facilitators have worked very closely with Sandy and, and Priscilla, who's had the responsibility for uh, working with them as a learning team, and that's been very important to our model. The excitement of those staff members was more powerful than any directive or any in-service that have, that's happened in the last uh, several years. What was going on in those grade two classrooms sparked curiosity of all the staff. The, the biggest uh, aha for them was when they came through a literal parade of teachers coming through the classroom to see the kids' band show and the types of work and the level of responses that the grade two students had produced. Um, I think that was the biggest engagement of the teachers in the lesson study and the, the staff as well. Well, we want our kids to be producing work like that as well. So then that started the conversation. How did you do it? What was the pre? How does this work? And uh, that led into our last Learning Community Day. We spent time doing a, a band show of our own uh, problem that we did as adults. One of the advantages to having a teacher here in the school involved in the Collaborative Inquiry project was the ability of that teacher to work one-on-one -on -one with other teachers in the school in a co-teaching setting. Uh, in addition to that, it was great afterwards that we had the time to debrief the lesson and perhaps look at uh, how to improve that lesson the next time and bounce things off of each other that essentially would improve student learning in the future. My participation in the study group was a, a great opportunity for me to uh, talk to colleagues and get in touch with the teachers uh, once again and find out some new instructional strategies and the high yield strategies in particular that uh, truthfully benefit student learning. We've all read a lot of research that actions will change beliefs and that that change of action and our change of practice has to happen first before our beliefs will ever change and I think this project has put that out on the table so to speak mm -hmm. and is the proof mm -hmm. that through looking at our student work, through noticing the gains in our students' achievement with our changes of practice, have changed our beliefs as teachers that yes, we can make a difference in our children's lives when we're adopting different practices and different teaching strategies. So our beliefs have changed around not just our comfort level with numeracy, but how we introduce numeracy strategies in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen as well in, with a lot of teachers in, our, in the project, and especially one in particular I'm thinking of, what happened was by having someone else in the classroom, it supported that person to mm -hmm. try something new. And then when we met again at the next research session, the person came up to me and said, Ben, you know what? It just works. What you're saying just works, and for the first time I can do what I always know is a good thing, which is we need to be thinking more. We need to do less questions. We need to do them better. Mm -hmm. And so it certainly was a way to get uh, some support around an action that would support the beliefs that they already had. But how that gets done often is, is a little bit troublesome. The actions don't match the beliefs. And this certainly how the actions match in the beliefs. We now have many teachers as well as administrators and our consultants and myself as a program superintendent with a lot more comfort level within our numeracy classrooms and we have changed beliefs mm -hmm. and that is paramount mm -hmm. for the achievement of our students in the future. Thank you for joining us for Coaching for Student Success in Mathematics. You have seen some key mathematics teaching and school organizational practices that are effective for coaching all students to be successful in mathematics. This webcast is archived for your convenience. You may access the entire webcast or choose a significant segment for individual or group study. Select a strategy to implement in your own mathematics classroom 
and reflect on its impact on student learning. Consider applying a school and board organizational strategy to plan for next year's professional learning. We encourage you to visit www.curriculum.org for archived and upcoming webcasts and support materials. The Literacy and Numeracy Secretariat welcomes your feedback as we continue to support professional learning and improve student achievement in Ontario.